We have a lot going on here at Little River United Church of Christ. And this week, we want to remind you that today at noon, the book club will be meeting virtually on Zoom. Everyone is welcome to join. The Zoom link information can be found in today's bulletin. We're inviting you to sign up for our sacred listening circles, which have, uh, those meetings um, will be taking place and you can find the sign up genius link in today's bulletin. Also in Friday's email communication, current tidings, or you may contact the church office. We hope as many of you as possible will sign up for those listening circles. There are a few other items for us to go over today. Our communication alert was sent out this week regarding some changes in the order of worship as we transition to in-person and online streaming for our hybrid Sunday services. During today's passing of the peace, those who are joining us online can use the Zoom chat, which uh, you will find on your, on your board, on your screen, to share greetings with others online today. Our music for worship service is pre-recorded at this time, so we will continue to experiment with our new online streaming video and audio equipment. Our fellowship hour will still be held today on Zoom following worship. We will take a five minute break and then rejoin for our fellowship time together online. Our T's and C's, thanksgivings and concerns will be shared during our fellowship hour. Let us continue in worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Come. Let us come into the house of the Holy One with song and dance. We have come to worship our God, the creator of heaven and earth, seas and rivers, and all that dwells within. The Lord of the dance beckons us to join in this time of celebration and joy, that we might know that we are gathered in God's holy place. We join the psalmist with songs of the glory of the God of hosts. We seek to know God's faithfulness and wisdom. Let us enter God's rhythm of life and follow in the ways of the word. God will bring us home where dancing and joy will never end. Are they dry when you put them in and make my Yes. I, um, about dinner time, put water in a little um, pressure.
Please join me in the invocation. Holy God, we confess that too often we have not been open to the rhythms of life you offer to us. We let ourselves be put off your pace and allow ourselves to wander off into our own songs. Too often, the melodies of the world confuse us. We have led ourselves and others to paths that are not according to your loving pace and direction. Help us pay attention with all of our senses. Make our dancing faithful. Help us take the risks that are part of letting you lead. Pull us back into your rhythms, clean our hearts, purify our hands, and steady our feet that we might know and share your blessings. We invite you now to pass the peace by typing your words of peace in the chat box as we will remain muted and continue in our worship. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pray. Loving God, you call us out of the world to worship you alone. You send us into the world to proclaim good news and to heal. In all our ways, help us to honor you through our obedience to your word. Remind us again and again, you are our God and you will not forsake us. Give us courage to love one another and to care for the brokenhearted and for those who are neglected. Thank you for shining your light on us so we can give hope to others 
even in these dark days. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. And it concerns the death of John the Baptist. Hear now the reading of the word. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah, and others said, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests, and the king said to the girl, ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately, she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved. Yet out of regard for his oath for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with order to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. Here ends the reading of this word. Will you pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, my strength and my redeemer. Carolyn has read for us a gruesome tale. It is written in retrospect. It is thinking back to what had happened previously. The text is really about Jesus, Jesus' power of preaching and Jesus' ability to speak a word and heal broken bodies and even raise the dead. Jesus has the power of the spirit inspired by God. God inspired joy. And his power is so incredible that people are talking about him. Well, who is this? Is this the distant prophet Elijah? Who is this? And as the rumor of Jesus' good works spread across the land, it reaches the ears of Herod. Now, there were six Herods. <laughs> there was Herod's father, Herod the Great. We remember him from the Christmas story. He's the one who ordered the death of babies. That was the first Herod. This is Herod's son. This is actually the third Herod on the kingdom. And Herod is a puppet king under the rule of Rome. He can exert power over the people under him, but his real power eludes him. He's a puppet king of Rome, but he has the power of life and death. And so as people are wondering about this Jesus, this this man who comes from our community, out of Galilee, from, from Nazareth. Who is he really? What's going on? And it's, it's, it's Herod who suggests, maybe this is John the Baptist 
who I kill coming back with all of this power. Carolyn, thank you for reading this text. It's, it's a gruesome text. It, it even moves me, even as I hear it read again. It has moved me all week in reading and rereading what is a familiar and yet unfamiliar story. It is beyond our imagination. His father killed babies. The second Herod, Archelaus, was in power after Jesus was born and his mother and father, Joseph and Mary, decided not to return to Bethlehem because they were afraid of this second Herod. And so they escaped to Egypt to protect their, their son. And that Herod eventually was replaced by Pontius Pilate. That name comes up again in the story of Jesus. But this morning, Carolyn has read for us about the third Herod, Herod Antipas. This Herod who had married his brother Philip's wife and John the Baptist, the preacher, had warned him against such a thing. It's immoral, <laughs> it's sinful. You're the king, you can choose anyone. Why would you choose your brother's wife and violate your brother and violate yourself. Well, Herod didn't like that message. And so he had John put, put in jail. He, he actually liked John. He was humored by it. John for him was, was entertainment. He, he thought he was kind of an interesting guy, if you would. But he crossed the line when he, when he told this puppet king You've done something very sinful by marrying your brother, brother's wife, Philip's wife. So he was disturbed. He had John put in prison, not, not to kill him, but to punish him, to let him do time to think about his violation of speaking directly and honestly to the king. And so it is this story that's being remembered as people are trying to understand who is this Jesus? This one who speaks power, who raises the dead and heals the sick and causes the lame to walk. Who is this Jesus? And Herod is wondering, is it John the Baptist who's come back? No doubt, Herod has had some nightmares about having John killed. But what a gruesome story. I wanna take the romance out of this story. Herod's niece, who is now his stepdaughter because he has married her mother, Herodotus, has come and danced for Herod and his cohorts in this grand celebration of Herod's birthday. She comes and she moves the whole crowd with her dancing ability. And of course, if I go to a foul thought in my mind, I think she did more than arouse the beauty in her dance steps. I think she aroused the sexual reality of her stepfather and uncle Herod. He is overwhelmed by her movement and her dance. He, he is so overwhelmed, he goes out of his mind and says, I'll give you anything up to half of my kingdom. You just ask me, I promise you, whatever you ask, I will give it to you. He was delirious. He was out of his mind, moved by her dancing. Now that's pretty crude, but what comes from that is even worse. So she doesn't know how to respond to her, her uncle daddy, if you would. And so she goes to her mother, Herodas, who hates John the Baptist because he has told the truth about this vile relationship that she and Herod have. So when this, when this daughter comes to her and says, mama, daddy says, uncle daddy says, I can have anything I want. What shall I, what shall I say to that? And Herodotus, as insane and vile as she was, said, tell him to give you John the Baptist's head. Now just think about that. He, he has made a promise. Herod has made this promise. And this young girl comes back with her mother's instruction, give to me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. 
and, and Herod in, in, in front of his audience, his cohorts, the, those who have come to celebrate his birthday, who have come to this banquet, who are in a celebrative mood. Herod now finds himself with an insane request. More than a request, it's now an order because he said, whatever you ask, I will give it to you. In front of everybody, he's made this, this promise. And she comes back with this gruesome request, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. Let your imagination follow this scheme. In the midst of his brokenness, in the midst of his disappointment, his, his celebration has now ended. I'm talking about Herod. This request that has come back so gruesome, so ugly, so vile, in front of everyone who heard him make the promise, now finds himself compelled to follow up on his promise. I'd like to think Herod would be man enough to say, girl, you out of your mind. I am not gonna do anything so gruesome. You go back with another, another promise. That was not part of the deal, not what you've requested. But Herod wasn't that kind of man. He bows down to this gruesome, vile request to John in his jail cell. And he orders his minions to go and bring John's head to him in a platter. Oh, this is supposed to be a banquet. I've never seen someone's head severed from their body. I can't even imagine what that's like, but this story is taking us to the bowels of gruesomeness. And they bring the head of John into the room, into this banquet, no doubt bleeding and ugly and gruesome and presents it to Herod who gives it to his niece, stepdaughter, who takes it to her mother to confirm that the request has been fulfilled. I, I, I don't know about you, but it just, it kind of turns my stomach to imagine such a vile and gruesome act, such a promise that would result in the slaughter of the innocent. A head on a platter as a gift to her mother? What kind of a person would do that? What kind of a person would receive that? What kind of a person would even make such a request? It, it tells us that something has gone afoul here. Something has gone terribly wrong, that humanity has lost its sense and consciousness. I, I wish I could tell you this morning that the story is lost in the distant past. I, I would like to say to you this morning, this is from antiquity, it has nothing to do with today, but we have the exact same vile behavior even today, innocent people who are slaughtered, innocent people who find themselves at the whims and will of those who have power and they don't use their power for good, but for evil. Whether it is the, the bombing of innocent people in villages, whether it is the homeless on our streets, whether it is the people who go to work every day but don't make enough money to take care of themselves. And God forbid if someone in the household gets sick and has to go to the hospital, we have this same vile behavior today. But in the midst of all that is taking place, we still have the opportunity to be redeemed. We still have the opportunity to hear another word, a word that is inspired by God to bring joy to a world that is broken. I told you that there were six Herods. We are talking about the third one. But there were others also. And there was that one Herod, the last Herod, who had heard the preaching of Paul and Peter and, and was so moved. He says in, in Acts 26, in short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian. How does one with such a history and lineage, even though he's not compliant with his own words, imagine becoming one of those identified as outliers and outlaws because of their faith. What does it mean today to be a Christian? 
What does it mean today to be a follower of Jesus in the midst of all that is taking place around us? Do we close our eyes and pretend we do not see? Do we close our ears and pretend we do not hear? Do we harden our hearts and pretend we do not feel all the agony and tragedy that's taking place in our midst? No, we may not be bringing a human skull into the room, but we have people today who are suffering just as much. We have people near to us unable to determine their own destiny, even today. And we are called as people of God to bring God's inspired joy into the lives of those who are, have given up hope. We are called today to take this text out of antiquity and bring it into modernity, to make it as modern as tomorrow's headline. We are called to be change makers, to be the John the baptizers, to speak a word that is disturbing because it is true. We're called to be aligned with those who are cast out and cast aside. We can hold this story, this question about who is this Jesus somewhere in the distant past, even in a distant land, or we can bring it up to date because Jesus is with us. Jesus resides within us. Jesus calls us out of the world so that we can be a critical alternative difference in the lives of those who are hopeless and have given up. We have another word today. We want God's inspired joy to touch the lives of those who have been left out and left behind. We have a choice today. We can hear the word even as Herod, the third Herod, heard the word from John and was amused by it while his wife was infuriated by it. There are those who are waiting. They would like to know, what do I do in the midst of my misery? There are those who are wondering, who cares about me? Who is here with me? We're called out of the world to be an alternative to those who have given up. John the Baptist could have kept his mouth shut. He could have let Herod do what Herod was doing and talked about other things. But John the Baptist had the audacity to speak truth to power. We today, we who identify as followers of Jesus, we are called today to speak truth to power. It may be disturbing, it may be dangerous, but we're called out of the world to speak another word to the world. Our lives, our purpose is inspired by God. We come and we gather in the sanctuary on Sunday morning, but we're not called to live here and stay here. We're called to come and be refreshed and refueled here to leave this space and to go into the world. We're called not to be silent, not to be observers, in the grandstands. We are called to be on the playing field of life. We're called as the people of God to speak truth to power, to risk our lives, and to go audaciously into the world with another word. God-inspired joy comes through us as an instrument and a siren to the world. So what will we do with this story? The people wanted to know, who is this? Is this Elijah, the ancient prophet? Or is this John the Baptist who was murdered by the king? What will people say about us during these days? How do we respond to those who cry out, to those who are wondering, how long, oh God, how long? I invite us to take the story of John even as people were questioning, who is this Jesus? And make it our own story for a time that requires God-inspired joy. For this is the gospel. Praise be to God. Amen.
come to a time in our worship when we're all invited to participate in our call to offering. And you're able to give to Little River United Church of Christ by mailing a check to the church or by visiting our Donate Online page, which is found on our website at www.lrucc.org. We invite you also to give to the Congregation Action Network's COVID-19 Emergency Fund and visit the Action and Outreach page on our website. And for those who are with us virtually, you can go to our website and click and make your offering. We give thanks to God for the gift of life, the gift of capacity to share from what we have, the gift of this offering that comes from so many sources to be used in service. In the name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above the heavenly host. Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. Amen. And for our mission moment this morning, we have two of our own who will come and share with us. We invite to our microphone and to our cameras this morning, Gail Perry and Karen Clyde. Good morning, Little River. The first people of various Native American nations used healing circles to create and maintain safe and harmonious communities, especially when a member of the community was hurt or ill. I wish to acknowledge Native Americans for the spiritual process that has been passed from one generation to another. I've experienced this process on more than one occasion. The spiritual or sacred, sacred circle process engages the entire community in healing. Everyone is heard if they wish to speak. Everyone in the community has the opportunity to speak his, her, they truth in a safe and confidential space. I have experienced several diffi difficult transitions while a member of this church for approximately 15 years. Each time a transition occurred, I never really understood why it was happening and trusted that more experienced members would lead the congregation through. However, the most recent transitions angered me and I felt despair and more unsafe than ever before due to what I perceived as a lack of transparency open communication and honesty. I recently participated in a sacred circle with uh, LRUCC members who were receiving facilitation training. I had an opportunity to speak my feelings and share my observations about multiple transitions that have occurred during my membership. I was surprised to feel safe enough to share honestly and to find that several others felt the same or similarly. This is the first time that I began to understand the cycle in which Little River has repeated over and over again. For the first time, I felt clarity about the hurt and harm that appears to be self-inflicted by the community as a whole. Now it is time to stop the cycle that plagues this church community. I invite each of you who are listening to participate in a sacred circle on July 18th or August 1st from three o'clock to five o'clock p.m. I also ask that you extend my invitation to anyone who is a member of this community or a visitor who did not return. This is, this is now the time to begin to heal the hurt and harm. Now is the time to listen to God's words and act on them for the health and well being of this church. Thank you for listening. Good morning. 
So like Gail, I participated in the facilitators training for the sacred listening circles last, well, June 27th in the Jubilee room here at Little River. We all agreed to be there, but we were not quite sure what to expect. That afternoon, we experienced the process ourselves. It was amazing. A safe space was created by sharing a value that we honor in this beloved community. I heard words like empathy, trust, honesty, acceptance, and transparency. We sat in a circle and we took turns speaking with a talking piece. We listened deeply to each other. A sense of trust was created as we shared our experiences with Little River, as well as ideas for strengthening our community. I believe that it's through listening to each other, accepting one another, that we will live out who we want to be at Little River. Let us pay attention to how we care for one another how we speak to each other. Let us truly listen to each other. Let us be vulnerable and together create a safe space and Christ's beloved community. Here's a quote from one of my favorite authors, Brene Brown. As children, we found ways to protect ourselves from vulnerability, from being hurt, diminished, and disappointed. We put on armor, we used our thoughts, emotions and behaviors as weapons. We learned how to make ourselves scarce or even disappear. Now as adults, we realize that to love with courage, purpose and connection, to be the person we long to be, we must again be vulnerable. We must take off the armor, put down the weapons, show up and let ourselves be seen. So like Gail, I invite you to join our sacred listening circles the first one is next Sunday from three to five. Do please sign up ahead of time and take off the armor, step into sacredness and be vulnerable. Let us commit to one another that this process is just the beginning of opening our hearts to each other, showing up with those values that we hold dear and living together as the body of Christ. May we be whole again. Eternal Spirit, please be with us, guide all of us Little River members as we go through this time, this difficult time of change, of deep transition in many ways. Please guide us through a thoughtful, sacred listening circle process. And please also guide the church staff as they help us work through this and also as we transition to hybrid worship. Um, we ask this in your name, amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. No. 
Friends, as we come to the end of our worship, it is time for our service to begin. We go forth into the world in faithfulness, join all those who have danced with the Lord throughout the generations, take the song and rhythm of God's word into the world, and invite others to celebrate the joy with us. We go into the world unashamed, unafraid, and unapologetic. We go audaciously, bodaciously, and courageously into a world that is awaiting our arrival. Amen. We thank you for being with us this morning in our first uh, in-person hybrid virtual worship service. We're going to take a five-minute break and go into our fellowship time together. We invite you to join us on Zoom, and we would like to invite others to invite others to be with us in the coming weeks as we continue to test our new system and worship in person and virtually. We'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> 